Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Perplexity, a mystery podcast. As always, I am your host, Kadra. Very excited to be here again, bringing you guys another wild and perplexing story. Uh, We are at the top of the show. So before we get to the episode, a couple of quick housekeeping things, as always. First and foremost, if you've been enjoying the podcast and you haven't done so yet, please take two seconds, hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel, or hit the star rating button if you are listening on one of your podcast platforms. Leave a five-star review. It really, really helps the show, and that is the best way to boost the show up the algorithms so that I can get these stories to more people. You can also follow the podcast to keep up with when a new episode has come out. And be sure to check out my socials and keep in touch that way. Those are Perplexity Mystery Podcast on Instagram and TikTok. And you can always send topic requests or tell me a crazy story of your own by DMing me on Instagram or sending me an email. That is perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. At the end of today's episode, I will actually be sharing a listener story. So really excited to finally be getting some stories from you guys. Don't be shy. Please send me your stories. I promise I want to read them. Just let me know if you want to remain anonymous, please. If you missed last week's episode, I covered another cult. That was the story of Rajneesh Puram, also known as the Rajneesh Movement. And just such an insane story. That cult operated for a pretty long time, but really peaked during the 80s. And they are responsible for the largest bioterrorism attack to date in U.S. history. (laughs) And they were led by a sex guru, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. So as you can already tell if you haven't listened to that episode, it's crazy. (laughs) So definitely go back and listen to that if you haven't. Today's episode is going to be a paranormal episode, and the listener story at the end will also be paranormal, fitting into our theme. Uh, So trigger warning, though, for today's episode. This episode may contain content that others will find disturbing, especially listeners below the age of 13. So listener discretion is advised. The sources for today's episode will all be available in the show notes. Okay, so let's get into this story. I learned about this probably a year ago when I was watching Unsolved Mysteries, amazing show, chef's kiss, and they had an episode called Tsunami Spirits, and it is all about these ghosts that started appearing in northern Japan, so we are going to talk about it. Let's get into it. I'm pretty much going to tell this story just like they did in Unsolved Mysteries, and I'm just going to add in a couple of other sources. So in the Tohoku region, there lays the town of Ishinomaki, surrounded by oceans, rivers, and mountains. The Kitakami River created the port for Ishinomaki, which brought great wealth to the town. The Ishinomaki citizens had a great love for the ocean, but this would all change on March 11, 2011. This is when a massive earthquake with a 9.1 magnitude, struck the area. The earthquake most significantly impacted the Tohoku region of northeastern Japan. Offices, libraries, and factories shook violently, leaving employees absolutely terrified. But once the earthquake was over, the terror had only just begun. Experts knew that an earthquake this large would definitely result in a tsunami. Emergency radio broadcasts went out, urgently warning residents to flee as quickly as they could. Protocols were followed with clear instructions for evacuation. Just one hour later, the tsunami came. But what experts did not predict was the size of the tsunami. The damage would be insurmountable. And footage can be seen in Unsolved Mysteries. It's absolutely horrifying. You see this dark, muddy water just absolutely engulfing the bridges, the towns, sweeping buildings away. Things are collapsing. Uh, Cars are being swept away. It's terrifying. Footage also shows water rushing into parking lots and people running away screaming. 
Soon after, large office buildings can be seen floating down riverways and entire towns are being washed away by this powerful, dark water. Citizens urgently rushed to higher ground, but for many, it would be too late. The maximum height of the tsunami was estimated to have reached 131 feet. Just gives me chills even saying it. One survivor interviewed recounted his experience. He said, quote, The tsunami was gaining force and growing larger. My ceiling caved in. All the lights started to break. The moment I felt I was in serious danger, the impact hit me. The impact pushed me outside. I couldn't tell what was up or down. I thought I was going to die. I saw the faces of my wife and children. I tried my best to swim up for air. Eventually, I reached the surface. I floated away weightless. I wondered where I was going as I was carried away. End quote. Soon after the tsunami, it started to snow a lot. So these survivors that were already wet were now being pelted with snow. The storm resulted in over 15,000 deaths. 15,854 to be exact, and 2,533 people went missing. In the months that followed, hundreds of strange encounters would be reported. The following day, March 12, 2011, the story spread across the world. One citizen of Ishinomaki found out that morning 54 of his co-workers had died in the tsunami. Another survivor, Kazuya Sasaki, was interviewed in the Unsolved Mysteries episode. He had lost his entire family in the tsunami, which I cannot even imagine, just the weight of that loss. He recalled first finding his oldest daughter in a bamboo forest, saying, quote, Some of the bamboos were bent, and I saw my eldest daughter draped over one of them. She looked like she was sleeping. She looked so beautiful. There wasn't a single cut on her face, end quote. He then went on to recount the discovery of his other loved ones, saying, quote, the body of my wife was a three-minute drive away from here when it was found. A week or two after the earthquake, we were cleaning up the debris, and I was looking for my youngest daughter. And I then heard someone shout, I've found a baby. The baby's face was swollen and covered with mud, so I cleaned her face and recognized that it was my youngest daughter. End quote. The storm had also resulted in failure of the nuclear power plant, so there was a lack of fuel and electricity to this area. This meant the crematorium wasn't functioning. So as if these losses weren't traumatic and horrifying enough, People couldn't have funerals for their loved ones. And in Japan, it's traditional to cremate bodies of loved ones. But they were forced to instead bury thousands and thousands of dead underground. Later on, they would dig them up and cremate the bodies. One survivor, Tai Kaneda, who was a reverend at the Sudai Temple, recalled, quote, The bodies were carried in one after another nonstop. It was devastating to see them all pass by me. The first dead bodies I saw were two fifth grade girls. I was not able to read a mantra because I couldn't stop shaking, end quote. Three months after the tsunami, a journalist named Shuji Akuno arrived in Ashinomaki. It was June 2011. He had started to hear rumors of ghosts in the area. By October, there were dozens of sightings being reported. It was Akuno's job to document people who had supernatural experiences. He continued to search for stories until August 2013. Akuno says, quote, One day, a man named Indu, or Indo, it's E-N-D-O, reached out to me. He had experienced something supernatural. On the day of the earthquake, he visited a shelter to see if his mother was there. He was told to, to wait there for her. So he waited. While he was waiting, 
he saw an older woman looking out the window and wearing his mother's clothes. As he looked closer, he realized it was his mother. He took out his camera to take a photo of his mother, so his family would know she was safe. But the woman's face changed into someone he'd never seen before. He found out that the microbus his mother was riding in was washed away by the tsunami around the same time he took that photograph in the shelter. Akuno then recalled another story of a woman who lost her three-year-old son in the tsunami. Inside her home was her deceased son's toy. One night, when she and her husband sat down to dinner, she called her deceased son's name, inviting his spirit to eat with them at dinner. The son's toy suddenly began to go off and make noises all on its own. The toy had a manual switch inside of an electrical one, so there was no way this toy could turn on by itself. This encounter changed the woman forever. Since her son's death, she had been suffering from panic attacks and severe depression. She was also beginning to have thoughts of suicide. But this experience reminded her that her son was watching her at all times. It helped give her purpose again. Shuji Akuno told another story of a woman who was preparing a meal one night after the tsunami, when she had a supernatural experience. There was a knock at her door, and when she opened it, a woman stood there, soaking wet. The woman asked for dry clothes. So this woman gave her some. Later, there was a knock at the door again. But this time, many people stood outside the door, all dripping wet. This woman believes these were ghosts of the tsunami. Kiyoshi Kanabishi, a professor of sociology at Tohoku Gakuen University, who specializes in sociology of disaster, explains grief counseling is not common in Japan. In fact, they're afraid it would make them forget the deceased. Tai Kaneda also delves further into traditional Japanese beliefs, discussing their strong spirituality, saying, quote, Japanese people don't separate the dead from the living, end quote. He compares the death of Japanese people to a shoji, which is a thin paper put on sliding doors throughout Japan. The veil between life and death, he says, is very thin, and the living can still see you through it. Each year, Kanabishi has his students do research on a topic of their choice. After the tsunami, he had a student named Yuka Kudo who wished to research the story of the ghosts of Ashinomaki. Throughout the student's research, many stories were uncovered. Many of the stories came from the dozens and dozens of local taxi cab drivers. So Kudo would interview these drivers. Referring to these stories, Professor Kanabishi explained, quote, The ones I found most believable came from taxi drivers because there were physical records connected to their sightings, end quote. 164 days after the tsunami, it was a hot August day, and a taxi driver picked up a man around 20 years old wearing a thick coat. A lot of these ghost sightings are strange because they often are wearing clothing that either doesn't fit with the time period or doesn't fit with the weather. It was a hot August day. This guy has a thick coat on, so definitely strange. And this 20-year-old got into the taxi for a ride. The driver immediately felt there was something strange about this passenger. But the taxi driver drove them to their destination. Throughout the drive, it began to get dark, and eventually the sun had set. Upon arriving at the destination, the taxi driver pulled over to let the passenger out. But when he parked the car, he realized there was no longer anyone in the back seat. They had disappeared. There were several other taxi drivers who had very similar experiences. In all cases, the taxi meters logged the drives. The drivers would end up having to pay for these rides. Because so many lives were lost in the tsunami, it's not surprising that many taxi drivers had also lost loved ones. So they said they would welcome these ghosts with open arms if they ever needed a ride again. Kanabishi explained, some may believe because the tsunami was so traumatic for the community, 
the ghost sightings are a way for the citizens to cope with their trauma and PTSD. But if that were the case after the Great Hansen earthquake or the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where many lives were lost all at once, data shows that ghost sightings were never publicly reported. So, why do people experience this ghostly phenomena after this particular earthquake in the Tohoku region? End quote. So after the tsunami, the town obviously had to be rebuilt, and there was so much damage. The Unsolved Mysteries episode was filmed in 2019, and it shows the debris cleared, but it's just miles and miles of empty fields and rubble. So these tiny, special, close-knit towns were just completely gone. So one survivor, a resident of Ishinomaki, named Kansho Azawa, was interviewed in what appeared to be a massive construction zone. She said, quote, My house used to stand somewhere around here, pointing towards the brown dirt and bulldozers. Quote, There used to be houses all over this area. It was like a small community. I don't see a trace of that anymore. It makes me very sad. After the earthquake, they wanted to go home, but the city had changed so much. Spirits didn't seem to know how to find their way home. Many of them didn't know how to contact their families. Lost souls don't have a place to go, so they ask people on the streets for help. End quote. Aizawa then explained that some people have abilities to see ghosts, while others do not. She could recall having this ability from the time she was a child. Aizawa experienced strange encounters following the tsunami that she described as paranormal, saying, quote, I was stopped by a group of young men who I knew were killed by the tsunami. They didn't seem to know that they were deceased, but I knew they were no longer living in this world from how they appeared. I could have simply ignored them, but I felt sorry for them, so I stopped. I asked them what happened. One of them said he wanted to go home, but that he was lost. I had to tell him the truth because I didn't want him to suffer anymore. I said, all of you have passed away, end quote. So now let's talk about a reverend in the area who I mentioned towards the beginning of the story, Ty Canetta. He is seen in the Unsolved Mysteries episode a lot. And Kaneta was a 26th generation reverend at the time of this interview. He had grown up in the Sudai Temple, and he later went to college and was trained to be a monk. But he would say in the episode, quote, Everything I've learned couldn't prepare me for what happened after the earthquake, end quote. In the aftermath of the tsunami, many people of the community would come to Kaneta for answers and closure. Within a month of the tsunami, Kaneta performed funeral services for 200 people. An excerpt from the book Ghosts of the Tsunami by Richard Lloyd Perry discussed Kaneta's experience, saying, quote, More appalling than the scale of death was the spectacle of the bereaved survivors. They didn't cry, Kaneta said to me a year later. There was no emotion at all. The loss was so profound and death had come so suddenly. They understood the facts of their situation individually, that they lost their homes, lost their livelihoods, and lost their families. They understood each piece, but they couldn't see it as a whole, and they couldn't understand what they should do, or sometimes even where they were. I couldn't really talk to them, to be honest. All I could do was stay with them and read the sutras and conduct the ceremonies. That was the last thing I could do, end quote. A common practice in the Tohoku area is for the dead to be invited by a spiritual shaman using a ritual called kuchiyos. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. This is where the shaman can act as a vessel and share the deceased person's story. He recalled one night, his wife answered the door to the temple. There was a young woman at the door who is referred to in the documentary as Ami, and she had come to the temple appearing ill. She pleaded for help, telling Kaneta, quote, I feel many people inside me, and I can't stop them. Many spirits are entering my body, and I can't stop them, end quote. Kaneta explained, 
He has worked with cases like this before, but quote, I never met someone who suffered as much as she did. She was the first, end quote. Ami was interviewed in the documentary, but her face was blacked out. She recalled the experience as, quote, so painful that I wanted someone to kill me. I felt the spirit of a girl crying inside me, and the spirit of a man was holding her leg and wouldn't let go. As soon as Reverend Canetta grabbed my feet, the spirit said, who are you? Reverend Canetta said, me? I am the reverend of this temple. The man replied, what is the reverend doing here? I was seeing this man yelling and screaming. It was terrifying, end quote. Canetta recalled asking the woman later if she happened to live near the disaster zone and if she had experienced the tsunami for herself, perhaps lost anyone close to her. However, she adamantly answered no to all of these questions. He said, quote, Ami herself had nothing to do with the tsunami, end quote. So pretty interesting because she hadn't been affected. She hadn't lost anybody. So she wouldn't be carrying the same trauma and PTSD that other people could have been carrying. Some skeptics may contribute that to like that being the reason they're seeing these ghosts. But this woman, Ami, didn't have any of that. And she experienced this whole possession, essentially. So then they go on to explain exactly what happened to Ami during this encounter. So Ami recalled, quote, It was the year after the earthquake when the ghosts of the tsunami started invading my life, end quote. Ami had to visit Kaneda many times because these possessions continued to happen over and over for seemingly no reason at all. Kaneda recalled she would often come in the evening around 7 p.m. and had to often stay in the temple until 2 or 3 in the morning. Kaneda said, quote, Through Ami, I was able to listen to the solemn voices of the spirits who lost their lives in the tsunami, end quote. Ami recounted one spirit that entered her body as the spirit of a little girl who had to let go of her brother's hand in the tsunami. Ami said, quote, the girl heard her brother saying, sis, I can't run anymore. But she wouldn't respond to him because they had to keep running from the water. I could see, hear, smell, and feel everything, even the touch of her brother's hand. She was so scared, and I was too. She saw her brother being washed away. Reverend Canetta spoke to the little girl. She reached out to him so he held her hand. But then she said, no, and she let go of him. Mom, mom, I want mom. I felt helpless. Why isn't anyone helping her? End quote. Kaneda's wife was often there to witness these rituals, so she recalls all of this as well, verifying Kaneda and Ami's stories. Kaneda's wife said, quote, it seemed the little girl wanted to apologize to her mom, for letting go of her brother. She kept saying, Mom, I'm so sorry. She was looking everywhere for her mom. I was near her at the time, so I chose to act as her mother and held her hand. She had a really strong grip. I said, Mom is right here. I will never let go. You are always here with me. I said to her, let's walk towards the light, and she started to follow me. I told her, go to the light, Everyone is waiting there for you. Then Ami was finally able to let go of my hand, end quote. And as if this wasn't enough stories, there are many more like this. In the book, Ghosts of the Tsunami, Death and Life in Japan's Disaster by Richard Lloyd Perry. The experiences of a local man are well documented. The man in the book, named Takashi Ono, a pseudonym, and the man lived many miles away from the tsunami. One day, he drove to the beach to survey the devastation and was shocked by what he saw. His possession began that night. Perry said in an NPR interview, quote, He came back that evening, sat down for dinner with his family, had his tea, a can of beer, then began rolling around on the ground making animal noises. 
running out into the field behind his house, rolling in the mud to the horror of his wife and his mother. He woke up the next day not knowing anything about this. And this continued for three days. He was talking in a strange, guttural way, threatening violence, talking about the dead. His family were beside themselves, and they eventually persuaded him to go to the priest, who recited the Buddhist sutras and drove out these spirits, and he felt a lot better after that, end quote. Reverend Kanetta is also featured in Perry's book. Reverend Kanetta went on to help many people in the aftermath of the tsunami. He gave them closure and helped their spirits move on. He felt it was his duty. He did recall that in order to help Ami, he had to go against traditional Buddhist teachings, but he really didn't care. He said, quote, When I see a woman who's suffering, I feel obligated to help her rather than worry about my religious beliefs. I don't believe any gods would get mad at me. I think they'd say, good job, end quote. Kaneda's interaction with Ami changed his life, saying his newfound purpose is to listen to people to help cure their pain. He also encouraged the people he helped to not fear the spirits, saying, quote, These ghosts aren't scary at all. They appear in front of you because they worry about you and long for you. So there's no need to be scared. If you see ghosts again, tell them. You are dead. There's a world for you to go to. We are living. We will remain in this destroyed city and will make sure to revive and restore our relationship with the city. Do not worry about us. End quote. He and his wife now run a cafe called Cafe de Monk. And this is where tsunami survivors get together for camaraderie. They do art therapy. They listen to music and just talk to each other. They even have massages. And it's just a really great way to have some peace and process their pain together as a community. The earthquake on March 11th, 2011 was the most violent documented earthquake to date in Japan. Thousands of lives were lost and thousands remain missing to this day. Many families were never able to give their loved ones a proper goodbye. More than 450,000 people were displaced and the country's infrastructure severely crippled. An article from National Geographic said, quote, In addition to the thousands of destroyed homes, businesses, roads, and railways, the tsunami caused the meltdown of three nuclear reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The Fukushima nuclear disaster released toxic, radioactive materials into the environment, and force thousands of people to evacuate their homes and businesses, end quote. But in all of these tragedies, places like Café de Monk can bring some light. Reverend Canetta's wife says, quote, Sun shines onto us because we have such a warm place for people to gather. I advocate for more joy, even if it's just for a moment, end quote. The Unsolved Mysteries episode was dedicated to the people of Ashinamaki and the victims, and it's very well done, so I would definitely recommend that you watch it. And that is the story of Ghosts of Tsunami and the 2011 earthquake and tsunami of Tohoku. Okay, so before we close out this episode today, I do have that listener story for you guys. And I haven't read it yet. I know it's paranormal, so I figured it would nicely fit in. This story comes from Amanda D., a listener that I've had the pleasure of talking to a little bit on Instagram. And Amanda D. is also a fellow podcaster. So check out her podcast, Shadows in the Attic. It is a paranormal podcast, and she does a great job. So Amanda says, hello, my name is Amanda D., And I have been wanting to share the experiences that I had as a child for some time, but I haven't had the opportunity. Now that I've found your podcast, I knew that this would be the perfect time. I think that a lot of people who believe in the paranormal do so because they have had their own experiences, sometimes at a young age. For me, that was definitely the case. I grew up in 
Tara, Tara Hout, Tara, oh gosh, I'm going to say this wrong. <laughs> um, we're going to go with Tara Hout, Indiana, in a haunted house. The house was originally owned by my grandmother. My mom bought it from her once she became an adult. So both my mom and her brother lived there as children, and so did me and my brothers. I'll start off first by telling you about a story my mom once told me. She said that her brother, my uncle Ron, was at home one day, and he heard what he thought was my mom calling to him from the basement. Oh no, I don't like this already. <laughs> he heard her say, come here, over and over. <laughs> oh, he finally got annoyed enough to go downstairs and find out what my mother wanted. Once he got down there, he realized that the basement was completely empty. Oh no. <laughs> there was no one down there. He thought that she was probably messing with him and hiding down there somewhere, so he started looking around. There was an area in the corner of the basement where the furnace was. Three of the four sides of the furnace had a wall around it, and this was a place that would make a good hiding spot. Okay, so it's kind of like a little corner. He went over and looked between the wall and the furnace, and he was absolutely terrified from what he saw. Hiding between the wall was a little girl, but it wasn't my mom. Oh, no. <laughs> my uncle turned around screaming and ran up the stairs. He got halfway up the basement stairs when my mom appeared at the top of the stairs and asked him what he was yelling about. No, 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 no. I would be out of that house. <laughs> oh my gosh. This was the first story that I ever heard about the little girl ghost that our family came to call Camilla. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm not entirely sure where the name came from. It was one of the things that was just common knowledge growing up in my house. When I was younger, I had always been told that the house was haunted. There were always stories circling from my mom and her brother, but it wasn't really a scary thing for me. It was just something that was. Interesting. Wow. I suppose it felt normal. Well, one day I had an incident of my own. I wanted my brother to take a walk with me down to the corner store so that I could get some snacks. I stood at the bottom of the stairs and called up to where his bedroom was. I didn't get any response. I heard some noises up there, so I knew he had to be up there just ignoring me. I yelled up again, this time more agitated. I told him to stop playing around. All of a sudden, a VHS tape came flying down the stairs directly at my head. Oh my gosh. No. <laughs> oh, I'm laughing because I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> I must have moved just in time because I was able to escape it hitting me. Obviously upset, I ran to my mother and told her that my brother had just thrown a VHS tape at my head. She told me that it was impossible. My brother had left hours ago to his friend's house. Oh my gosh. I was stunned. I wasn't sure what to say. I ran up the stairs to his bedroom, and sure enough, the entire upstairs was empty. I really couldn't believe what had happened. My mom told me that the tape must have just fallen off the top step or something and slid down. Dot, dot, dot. But that wasn't what happened. <laughs> yeah, no. Amanda D., I believe you. It flew down the stairs and hit your head. So that wouldn't make sense. And then she says, it hadn't even touched any of the stairs. It hadn't fallen and then bounced. It was thrown with really great force directly at me. There was another time when I was younger, when I was sleeping in a room in the basement. This was my childhood home, and me and my two brothers' bedrooms were moved around quite a bit. At this point, they had been moved to the basement. One night when I was sleeping, I woke up. I couldn't tell you what exactly it was that woke in me, but when I did wake up, there was a man standing at the end of my bed. He was kind of white and kind of see-through. 
He had on dark pants and a white shirt and a hat from what I can remember. The weird part was that the man didn't vanish like you sometimes hear people say. He just stood there looking at me and I was looking back stunned. Wow. I can't remember exactly what happened for the rest of the night, as I was pretty young when this happened, but I know that it terrified me. Yeah, that would absolutely terrify me too. Another thing that I can remember about the house was that I think it had a way of making people take on violent behaviors. Well, at least the basement did. There were multiple times when my room was in the basement where some unnerving things happened. People who were me and my brother's friends would come over to the house and all of a sudden their demeanor would change. They would get mean and rude, start doing things that were really unlike them. At one point, one of my brother's good friends even tried to assault me. Oh my gosh. I don't want to get into details about that, but it was the time that it was a time that definitely sticks in my mind. Yeah, wow. That That's terrible. I'm so sorry. Another time when I was younger, I moved back into my mom's house for just a couple of weeks. I moved back into the basement. My mom was having a nice night with her boyfriend at the time and one of her boyfriend's close friends. They were listening to some 80s rock and just hanging out. I went to bed downstairs and fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to my mom's boyfriend and his friend both staring at me. What the hell? They were stiff as a board, shoulder to shoulder, not moving an inch. One of them was holding a knife from the kitchen. The other was holding a hatchet. Amanda, stop. Are you kidding me? No. This is a horror movie. I... I I can't, I literally can't speak. Wow. I was absolutely scared out of my mind. I had no idea what was going on and instantly started screaming for my mom and asking them, what are you doing? Get away from me. My mom rushed downstairs, horrified at the scene before her, and started screaming at the two of them to get back upstairs and get out. Once upstairs and away from me, Wow, okay, so they listened to you at least. (sighs) Once upstairs and away from me, it was like a switch went off and they were back to their normal selves. They didn't know what had just happened. They had no memory of going downstairs, no memory of going into my room, no memory of picking up any weapons. Something possessed them. I have no doubt about that. Something in the basement of that house was evil. Holy shit, Amanda, this is insane. Obviously, I moved back out as fast as I could a couple of days later. I can also remember as a teenager living in the basement, I was in a constant state of depression. I had always been a pretty happy kid, but once my room was moved down there, it was like a black cloud was constantly hanging over my head. I couldn't see the bright side of anything, and all I could think about was death. It got really bad. I actually ended up trying to take my life down in the basement by overdosing on a bunch of medication. Oh my god, Amanda. Wow. My mother had found me unmoving and unresponsive. Luckily, she found me in time and was able to rush me to the hospital to have my stomach pumped full of charcoal or whatever that black stuff is they use to absorb medication. I have no recollection of those events or even taking the medicine. There are some other incidents that have happened, but those are the most significant. I'm going to end the story here. I hope that you guys have enjoyed my paranormal stories of my childhood haunted house. Thanks, Amanda D. Wow. Oh my gosh, Amanda. That was like five stories in one. Thank you so much for writing that in. I'm so glad you're okay. And, oh my gosh, you've been through some insane shit. That is wild. So yeah, guys, go check out her podcast, Shadows in the Attic. Clearly, she has firsthand experience with the paranormal. And I have listened to some of her episodes so far, and I've been really enjoying them. 
yeah, I think that about wraps it up, guys. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please do not forget if you've been enjoying the podcast to follow all those great ways to support that are super easy. Just hit the subscribe button, follow the podcast if you are listening on a podcast platform and just hit the star rating option, leave a five-star review. Those are the best ways to help me and it is so, so appreciated. Don't forget to check out my socials, TikTok and Instagram. Those are Perplexity Mystery Podcast. I also have a website now. So if you guys want to check that out, I haven't bought a domain yet. I'm just using the free version of Wix. So if you want to check out the website, though, uh, you can go to my flow code link on my Instagram bio, and that'll show all the different ways to support the podcast and connect as well. And my website, I believe, is the first button on that flow code. And I've also put the website link in the uh, description of the podcast. You can go check that out. You can also submit stories that way now or just send me a message. Yeah, I think that's everything. But thank you guys so much for listening. You all are amazing. I hope you have a fantastic week and I will talk to you next week. Bye.